T minus four minutes and counting. Upper stage lock securing started. Vehicle transferring internal. This is Delta minutes. Mission Control at T minus four and holding. We anticipate picking up the launch count in just a few moments. The countdown clock has resumed and we are go for launch at 8.27 p.m. Eastern. Carry started. Vehicle transfer internal complete. CDC lock secured. T minus three minutes, 14 seconds. Second phase lock right. secured at flight level. CDC pre press started. T minus three minutes, seven seconds. CPC LH2 secured. T minus three minutes. Vehicle ordinance army. CBC press barges on. Vehicle ordinance arm. Hmm? CBC lock secure at flight pressure and flight level. T minus two minutes and 30 seconds in counting. The countdown is on track as we proceed towards T zero. Minus two minutes. EPA script early. Hydraulic press at 4,000. CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. T minus one minute, 30 T seconds. T minus 90 seconds in the launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and eastern range are go for launch. T minus one minute, 20 seconds. Upper stage LH2 securing started. T minus, T minus one, minute. one minute and counting. Rock report range status. Range green. Agent Starbucks go. T minus 50 seconds. Minus 45. Launch enable enable. Main power off. Minus 40. Second stage LH2 secure at flight level. Minus 30. T minus that 30 is seconds. Go Go Green board. Green board. Minus 25. Light lock in. Minus 22. It's our MTVC blowdown. Minus 15. Row for ignition. T minus 10. T minus 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. We have lift off. We have RS 27 main engine. We have liftoff, the United Launch Alliance, Delta IV rocket carrying WGS-5 for the United States Air Force. The wideband global SATCOM satellite provides significantly increased capacity to our nation's leaders, warfighters, and international partners. Looking good. You are hearing the, the voice of Steve Agid providing launch vehicle ascent data. Passing 36 seconds, Mach 1. Vehicle now going transonic. Chamber pressure is holding good in the first stage. Solid motor chamber pressure beginning to drop off as expected. Passing 50 seconds, Max Q. Maximum dynamic pressure in the vehicle. Coming up on the one minute mark. Mark, one minute. Velocity passing 1300 miles per hour. One minute, 10 seconds into the flight. Good chamber pressure holding on the first stage. 
Passing one minute, 15 seconds. Nitrogen supply valve is now open in the second stage. Standing by for a solid rocket motor burnout about 10 seconds from now. And burnout, standing by for SEP. We have separation, separation of the solid rocket motors. One minute, 47 seconds into the flight, the Delta vehicle now only weighs one half of what it did at launch. One minute, 52 seconds ago, expelling propellant at 1,850 pounds per second. Coming up on the two minute mark. Mark, two minutes. Still looking good. Now two minutes, 10 seconds into the flight, vehicle now traveling at Mach 5, five times the speed of sound. That's in the area of maximum fairing skin temperature. Chamber pressure right where we want it to be on the first stage. Coming up two minutes, 50 seconds into the flight, still looking good. Velocity now passing 9,100 feet per second, altitude 53.6 nautical miles, downrange distance 84.8 nautical miles. I think three minutes, seven seconds. Mark 10 seconds, Mach 10. Vehicle now going 10 times the speed of sound. Oh well. Separation. Fairing separation looks good. Hmm. Coming up three minutes, 50 seconds. Our events are occurring very close to their expected times. Passing the four minute mark. Partial thrust command. We have Miko, main engine has cut off. Standing by for stage sep, stage separation. Have Nets is deploying. Standing by for igniter spark. Igniter spark. And we have ignition. Ignition on the second stage. Second stage chamber pressure rising. Good chamber pressure, right where we want it to be. This, this is Delta Mission Control at T plus 4 minutes and 51 seconds. We've just heard Steve Agad report the successful execution of events comprising the early portion of the evening's mission. The mission is now in the first of two planned RL-10 second stage, second stage engine burns and all systems continue to operate nominally. This burn will last approximately 16 minutes. I am now joined by Colonel David Goldstein from the Air Force's Military Satellite Communication Systems Directorate. Colonel Goldstein, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Howard. It's a pleasure to be here for the fifth WGS launch. Colonel Goldstein, as we've seen, just seen a spectacular liftoff of the Delta IV rocket. How does it feel seeing the fifth WGS satellite on the way to orbit? It's a great feeling to see the launch of the fifth satellite, especially knowing how important this constellation is to our servicemen and women deployed around the world. Of course, the real work for our team is just beginning. Following separation from the Delta IV launch vehicle approximately 35 minutes from now, our team will continue orbit raising over the next 106 days. After another 49 days of rigorous testing by Boeing and the Army, because Army Strategic Command actually operates the payload, our team will reposition WGS-5 from the test orbit to the operational orbit over another 24 days. So you can see from this timeline 
There are still several months of hard work to do before the satellite is ready for operations. As I mentioned earlier, the WGS system provides an important increase in, in capacity over the legacy system. Could you explain what that means to our troops in the field? Sure. In order to illustrate that point, I'd like to discuss a few key capabilities of the WGS system and how it's a significant upgrade to its predecessor. First, WGS is the only military satellite communication system that can support simultaneously X and KA band communications with cross-banding to make communicating across terminal types transparent to the users. WGS currently collects and routes real-time data through the X band, KA band, and switchable X KA band terminals being used for strategic, tactical, and calm on the move, on the move communications. Each WGS satellite has such data capacity that WGS also performs the Global Broadcast Service mission, known as GBS. GBS is like DirecTV for our warfighters using KA band. Finally, WGS satellites are built to communicate with Airborne Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance, or ISR systems, by KA band. This capability provides the critical bandwidth necessary to communicate with multiple remotely piloted aircraft while simultaneously providing services to many other users. The WGS satellite must be quite advanced to be such a game changer for the Department of Defense. Would you describe some of the unique features of the satellite? Howard, just to put it in perspective, one WGS satellite has the equivalent capacity of the entire legacy system. These satellites provide an increased number of users' voice, data, and commanding at about 10 times the data rate previously available. Our user community consists of national leaders, ground and naval forces, embassies, and airborne ISR assets from the U.S. and our international partners. WGS enables more users to receive more information faster, giving us an advantage over our adversaries. This is the fifth WGS satellite. How will this satellite support the current constellation? The fifth satellite is the second of three in the Block 2 purchase. The final Block 2 satellite, WGS-6, will be launched later this summer. Another four satellites, WGS-7 through 10, are in production or will begin production soon. It's important to note that WGS Block 2 incorporates important technical changes from Block 1. These changes were based on feedback we received from our users. These improvements include a change to our KA antennas as well as RF bypass capability to support users requiring larger amounts of instantaneous bandwidth. In partnership with the Australian Defense Force, we contracted for the sixth satellite. In similar fashion, we partnered with Canada, Denmark, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and New Zealand to contract for the ninth WGS satellite. As vital U.S. allies and in exchange for their support, our partners will receive a proportional share of WGS resources. As you might infer from the number of satellites in production and on contract, wideband communications are in very high demand. Satellite communications is a critical capability for our nation's leaders and our men and women deployed around the world. WGS will provide that capability for the next couple of decades. WGS is the only high data rate communication satellite the Department of Defense operates. It provides the primary DOD link to ground and airborne forces, as well as to U.S. embassies and other authorized users. Very soon, WGS-5 will join WGS-1, 2, 3, and 4 in supporting our troops. Once operational, the WGS Constellation will provide near worldwide coverage. This is achieved because WGS-5 will be positioned to provide coverage to key missions within the continental United States. With WGS-5, a truly global operational capability will be achieved. In fact, with the addition of WGS-5, the final acquisition milestone for the program will be accomplished. Full Operational Capability, or FOC. With this additional KA band and a tremendous increase in X band, services will be provided around the globe to ensure no disruption to the mission. This is an extremely exciting time for the United States and our international partners. So WGS-5 seems like a big step forward for the maturity of the WGS constellation. That's correct, Howard. Declaring WGS full operational capability is a big milestone for Air Force Space Command, the Air Force, and our nation. Well, thank you, Colonel Goldstein. That's great information. I appreciate you giving us a glimpse into the wideband system. Now, let's check back with today's mission. Next major event is...